Hebrews 4.12 and 2 Peter 3.17 and 18. I'm going to go ahead and read both of those texts, um, both of those texts for us. Hebrews 4.12. It'll be on the screen as well. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of the Lord is active, for the word of the Lord, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And in 2 Peter 3, starting in verse 17, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Well, as I mentioned in the opening, uh, we are in a short three-week series called Sola Scriptura, where we are asking the question, what does it mean Uh, to live by Scripture alone. It's a short three-week series, so two weeks ago, we asked the question, can I trust the Bible? Can we trust that the copy of Scripture that we have in our hands is accurate and exactly what God uh, intended for us to have? And last week, one of our elders, Tristan, asked and answered the question, does the Bible have sole authority over my life? And we saw that the answer to that is yes, that since we can trust that the words in our scriptures are the very words of God, then there can be no question that this book has authority over our lives. And this book is necessary in our lives if we are going to know God. And then we saw that the Bible on its own is sufficient. There is nothing that needs to be added or changed about this book. It is exactly how God has intended it, intended it to be. Now, that leads us to today. If it is trustworthy and it is authoritative, then how does God intend for us to interact with it, right? How does God intend for us to use it? Because here's the reality. As I was praying this week and and looking over my notes, and I was thinking about all of us, I was for a moment um, just kind of, I don't know, how do I describe it? Overwhelmed? Emotional? (laughs) Um, Just thinking about our faith family and how much We really do, and we pass this by, and and this sounds corny, but we just really, we need God's Word. We just need it. And and that that idea, it's it's something that we all know in our heads, right? Yeah, we, we need the Word of God. But my prayer is that as we leave this place today, that we would physically feel that need. We would feel the need for the revealed words of God, because there are so many of us who walk into this room and life is just honestly just beating you down. You're beating you down. That that there is a sin or a multitude of sins that just has a hold of you, and you hate it. You, You hate that sin. You don't like what that sin does to you, but you feel like you can't escape it. And you walk into this room and you feel like there's a weight on your shoulder, like God is judging you, all the people of God are judging you, and there's no escaping it. And it makes you not want to sing. It makes you not want to pray. It makes you uh, not, not want to really listen right now. It makes you want to unengage because you're afraid of what's going to be revealed to you. And then there's some of you who your soul, or maybe physically, man, you're just hurting. I mean, you're suffering. Maybe you've lost someone. Maybe you have anxiety, fear about concern over your spouse or a family member, a child, a friend. And you just feel so burdened that the circumstances of life are really heavy on you. And so just to be clear, the last thing I want to give you today is my opinion about the usefulness of the Bible. That's not going to help you at all. But I want God to show us in his trustworthy and authoritative word why it matters. Why his word matters. That for the one who's trapped in sin or for the one who is suffering, and you need his word. I need his word, that the only thing that we need is the word of God, that the church needs to be a people of the word. And so that's the first thing I want us to look at, is for God to instill that idea in us, that we need the word, and that the church, historically, when it's at its healthiest, has been a people of the word. So go with me to Acts 2. Um, So keep your fingers in those verse 2 texts, and go to Acts 2, and I'm going to fly through the, back, the book of Acts very quickly, and I want to show you 
just how central the word of God is to the church, why this is important. And it's a reminder that if we are going to be claim that we are the people of God, that we can't forget that we are a people of his word. So the book of Acts, it's the story of the church in those early days. And I'm going to fly through these texts. And so maybe this will be a test for you to see if you can keep up. They'll also be on the screen. Um, but as we go through this, I want you to notice how often, and this isn't even all of them, this is just a flavor, a taste, how often the book of Acts mentions the word, right? How present the word was in the early church, that it's a central marker for who we are. So I'm going to start in Acts 2, uh, 41, and then I'm going to read a bunch of texts back to back. So you, it's in order, so you can just kind of turn the pages with me. Acts 2, 41 says, so those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Turn over to Acts 4, 4. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Acts 4, 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Acts 6, 2. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word. Acts 6, 4. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Acts 6, 7. And the word of God continued to increase. Go over to Acts 8, 4. Now those, this is after Stephen is stoned. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Acts 8, 14. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them to Peter and John, Acts 8, 25, now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem. Acts 10, 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the what? The word. And by the way, if it, anytime you, you hear a pause, it's obvious there's a word. So let's change it up. Really. Every time I say the word word, I want you to say it out loud, okay? Say it out loud. All right, Acts 11.1. 1. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word. There we go. All right, Acts 11.19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that rose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word. to no one except Jews. Acts 20, 12, 24. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Acts 13.15. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogue to the Jews. Oh, sorry, I passed it. <laughs> Proclaim the word, uh, Acts 13, 7. He was with them in pro-council, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word. Ah, Acts 13, 44, the next Sabbath, all, almost the whole, listen, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word. Acts 13, 46, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying it was necessary that the word. it was necessary. See that? Acts 13, 48, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word. Acts 13, 49, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. Acts 14, 25, and when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. Acts 15, 35, but Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Acts 16, 32, this is the jailer. You remember when we did the Philippian series? This is the jailer. They spoke the of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Acts 17, 11. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word. with all eagerness. Eagerness. Examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Acts 18, 15. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word. Occupied. You see that word? That's interesting. Acts um, 18, 11. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the Acts 19.10, this continued for two years so that all the residents, all the residents of Asia heard the word. Acts 19.20, so the word. continued to increase and prevail mightily. You get the point, right? You get the point. You don't have the church if you don't have the word. The word is supreme in the church and it is supreme in the people of God. Now, I wonder if there are some of you in here that as we read those, which I kind of felt that there was, which is why I had you say it out loud. As we read those passages, you began to check out. Even I checked out at one point, like I could continued reading <laughs> and didn't pause for you, right? But isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting for all of us? Because I think my fear, sometimes when, when you hear, okay, the sermon title is How to Use the Bible. Many people walk in and they think, well, here's how the pastor's just going to tell me about how bad I am for not reading my Bible every day. You felt like that when we started talking about this? 
There's something in us, right? There's, and it starts here. There's something in us that wants to run away or avoid the Word of God. There is something in our flesh that wants to deny our need for God's Word. There's something in us that does that. And by the way, it was no different for those in Acts. It was no different. It's not like they didn't struggle with the same struggles that we had. Look at the next chapter, Acts 20. Look at verse 7. All right, look at verse 7. It says, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. And here's what he says. He prolonged his speech until midnight. So the church gathers to fellowship. Paul starts preaching. And by the way, here we have biblical precedent for long sermons. (laughs) Just saying. And you might say, well, Colton, look what happens next in the text. Here's why we don't need long sermons. Verse 8, right? There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked longer. So the word there for sleep is the idea of being lulled to sleep, that Paul lulled this guy. So we have the first guy to ever fall asleep in church. Many successors, successors have come after him. None of you in this church. But Eutychus was the first. So, but here's the question. Why shouldn't you fall asleep in church? Well, look at the rest of the verse. Being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Biblical warning, don't fall asleep during my sermon, all right? All right, verse 10. Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while. So remember, they were going to go till midnight, but here, until daybreak. So Paul just keeps going. Now, I promise to get you out here by lunch. But here's my point. I think sometimes we fantasize the early church, and we kind of think they, they could have done no wrong. They had the same struggles we did. They have the same struggles. You may not be falling asleep, right? But there is a struggle for many of us to center our lives on God's word in each and every day. And I think there are two central issues to that. Two central in- issues. One, I think we underestimate the power of the Word of God, I think we underestimate it. We, under, we assume that we know the power of God's Word, but we don't. And two, I think we have misunderstood how we are to interact with it. We have misunderstood how we are to interact with it. So go with me back to Hebrews 4, and as I read Hebrews 4.12 again, I want you to, to focus on the descriptors in this text. Notice how Paul describes the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12. It says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, it's important, you you can't read verse 412 by itself. You just can't do it. There's too much happening in the context here to really understand um, what this verse means. So I want you to look back at Hebrews 4.11, the verse before it. We need to understand the whole context here to see just how good this verse is. So Hebrews 4.11, it says, let us therefore strive to enter the rest. Let us therefore strive to enter the rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Now, let me explain this. The rest that he is talking about in verse 4 is the restful salvation of God. It's the restful salvation of God, that you are forgiven of your sin and you are welcomed into fellowship with God. So rest, find peace in the reality that you have been saved. So, and then he says that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. What's he talking about here? What's the connection in verse 11 between rest and don't fall into disobedience? Well, he's referring to the Israelites in the wilderness here who did not enter the rest of God. They fell into the wilderness instead of entering the promised land. You remember that? And they didn't enter because of their disobedience. So Hebrews, go look at Hebrews 3.19. It says, so they were unable to enter. They were unable to enter because of why? This is a connection to the disbelief, the, uh, the disobedience, because of their unbelief. That unbelief is what kept them out of the rest. The disobedience is Unbelief. This is all going to connect. Stay with me. The question is, unbelief in what? Look at Hebrews 4, 2. It says, for good news, the gospel came to us, us, 
just as to them, but the message, which is the same word for the word of God, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So, so the message, the word, was not united in faith when it was presented to them. When they heard the word, the Israelites said, we would rather go to Egypt. They said, we would rather go to Egypt. We don't believe your word, so we will not do as you've commanded. So verse 11 says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. In other words, you want to enjoy salvation? Believe the word of God so that you may not miss out on the joy of the promised land. Now, verse 12, the word of God is living and active. This is the word they didn't believe. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of the heart, soul, and spirit, joints, marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, to be honest, this is part of the, you know, if, if I know we have many preachers in here. This is part of preaching that's frustrating because every one of these words deserves a sermon. Like, aren't you wondering in this text, soul and spirit, what's the difference? <laughs> right? Aren't you wondering what in the world joints and marrow have to do with the word of God? Like, does the pair living and active relate to the pair of soul and spirit and joints? What does the heart have to do with soul and spirit? I'm not going to be able to talk about any of it. I'm sorry. You're going to have to contemplate that. I'm not going to have time to talk about it. But the reality is we have a lot of forest here. We have a lot of forest here. So we don't want to get lost in the trees and miss the forest. Now, here's the forest. And then I'm going to bring it back to Hebrews uh, Verse 2 and 11. Here's the force. The word of God penetrates very, very deep. It penetrates very, very deep. That covers about six of those words. Like a sword, it cuts through our pride, sin, pain, and it exposes us. And when it penetrates through all the things that would keep us from believing it, it discerns us, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. What does that mean? I would say it like this. The Bible reads you, you don't read your Bible. Does that make sense? The Bible reads you, you don't read your Bible. That so many of us approach the word of God as if it is something to be conquered and achieved. That we can walk away feeling good about ourselves, but that kind of approach to the Bible is not lasting. It's not lasting. Instead, we are to approach God's word with the understanding that I don't read it. I don't read it. It reads me. It tells me about me. It tells me about who I am created to be. It tells me about a God who created me. It tells me about a God, a good God, and and it cuts me. But here's the deal. When we talk about reading the Bible, so many times in churches, we kind of think of it as, okay, it tells me where I'm good and it tells me where I'm bad. It's about exposing my goodness and about exposing my badness. No, it's so much deeper than that. And this is the connection between verse 2, verse 11, and verse 12. It's about exposing my unbelief that would keep me from the rest that is found in salvation in Christ. Does that make sense? It exposes my unbelief. It's not just about exposing your sin. It's exposing something deeper that you don't believe the promises of God. That it is revealing to you. It's God revealing to you. Here's my promises. Here's who I am. Here's who you are. And it cuts through all the muck and the mire and it says, this is where you're not believing me. This is where you're not believing me. This link, that you can't remove this verse and not talk about verse 2 of chapter 4. For good news came to them, came to us, just as to them. But the message, they, the word they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith, by faith with those who heard them. At the issue, at the bottom, where the word cuts through, the issue is faith. It's faith. Do you believe it? Do you believe this word? It's about exposing my unbelief, which we're all guilty of. We're all guilty of. We all doubt. We all struggle. No difference, no different from those in Acts. But the word of God meets us in that place and it reads us. It tells us who we are. It tells us what we're struggling with. It tells us where our hearts are not okay. And the gospel, the good news, cuts through it all like a sword. And when it gets to the bottom of our souls, it gets a bright light and it starts shining. And our unbelief is revealed. And when I'm full of anxiety, frustration, suffering, when I'm losing hope, and there's so many of you, I know you're there. 
the Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit cuts through it all. It cuts through it all. And it turns your unbelief to belief. It turns your unbelief to belief. And when you're settling on the sins of this world, trying to find just an ounce of satisfaction, the Word of God cuts through it all, and it turns the unbelief in His promises to belief. That you can find rest in the promises of God. You want to be free of that doubt. You want to be free from the anxiety that rules your heart. You want to be free from com- You want to find comfort and rest. And you have to let the word of God read you. Let it read you. Drop your pride. Come approach the word in humility and say, tell me who I am. Tell me who you are. I want to know. Instead of, God, let me tell you who you are. God, let me tell you about me. Let the Word of God tell you who you are and tell you who He is. Let it tell you about a good God whose words cut through all the noise and tells you about how He has sent His Son to suffer and die and raise from the grave. Understanding that in humility will turn your unbelief to belief. But you might say, okay, that's awesome. That's really cute, Colton. But practically, how does that work? Practically, how does that work? Well, go with me to 2 Timothy 3. All right, go with me to 2 Timothy 3. Um, And before we read this text, let me say one thing. Being a Christian can be incredibly frustrating. Amen? Sorry, I don't don't know if pastors will say that. Um, Because at the end of the day, we have no power over our own transformation. Did you know that? At the end of the day, we have no power over our own transformation. And you have no power over anyone else's transformation. You can't make yourself love God. You can't make yourself love the Word of God. And you can't make them, as much as you want to, love God. And you can't make them love the Word of God. Right? You can't make someone else do it. As, as much as we want to, right? Because the reality is, for most of us in this room, we want to love God. We want to love His Word, right? Like We're like Paul in Romans seven nineteen, where he says, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. That we have to understand before we move forward, without the work of the Holy Spirit, we will never understand. We will never love, and we will never be transformed. So, if we have no control over transformation of our own hearts, what do we do? Where does that leave us? Here's what I would say. Much of the Christian life is about positioning. It's about positioning. That you would position yourself to hear the Word of God. You would position yourself Under the word of God, you would position yourself in a community so that God can do the work. Does that make sense? That you would position yourself before God and you would be taught. You would be corrected. You would be transformed. So look at 2 Timothy um, 3.14. And as I read through these, I would ask you, are you positioning yourself to receive, for the word of God to read you? Are you positioning yourself to do that? 2 Timothy 3.14. He says, he tells Timothy, but as for you... Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, and he says this, this is important, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. Verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped, For every good work. All right, so here you see seven different ways that the word works within us. And the first thing I want to focus on is that he tells him to continue in what he has learned in the scripture, which he says makes you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. I love that. That this book reveals, the Bible reveals from cover to cover a holy God whom all, have rebelled, all have turned away from him. And yet, the Bible tells us that though we have run from him, God has pursued us. God has chased us. He's chosen us. And then, not only that, God came himself. God came himself and lived a sin, sinless life. He did not live in rebellion. And though there was no penalty for him to pay for sin, he paid it. Though Jesus did not deserve to die, he died. He died the death that we deserve. He died in our place for our sin, paying our penalty. And three days later, he rose from 
the grave, that this book makes us wise for salvation. It helps us understand the person of Jesus Christ. That the, this book says, hey, all those who would have faith in Christ, they'll receive him. That God will transfer the righteousness of Christ to each of us. And that when God looks at us, he sees not our sin, but the righteousness of Jesus. That's what this book tells us. It makes us wise for salvation. It, this book helps us understand the penalty of hell and the grace of heaven. That there is no place, understand this, there is no place, there is no place you will find the purpose of your creation other than the scriptures. It is the only place that will tell you why you were created, what were you, you were intended to be, and what God will make us into one day. It is the only place you will find that truth. So he says in verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God. Now, we touched on this a couple weeks ago, um, but we can't pass over it here. He says, all scriptures. And here Paul is referring to both the Old and New Testament. The Old and New Testament. He's referring to what will become of the New Testament. So from Genesis to Revelation, all of its revealed word, all of it is from God. And by the way, if I could go on a little sidebar here, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, um, that we don't really like to do like topical sermons here or topical series. And this is part of the reason why. And, and by the way, and so many of you have uh, thoroughly enjoyed this series, and I'm so thankful for that. But topical won't be the norm because it is too tempting for a preacher, uh, a small group leader, to pull out a scripture as a proof text to prove their opinion. Only for that scripture to be pushed aside or misunderstood. And the rest of the time is that pastor or small group leader just discussing what they think is right but the last thing you need is my opinion. <laughs> and, and so you, you don't need a pastor or a small group leader to pull a text out of the Bible. That's not what you need. You need the whole revealed word. All of it, from beginning to end, to see the whole work of God. So that's why typically we go verse by verse. We go by chapter or we go by book, right? So that we can see the full work. It ensures that we aren't using the Bible to prove our own opinion. That, that we don't need more opinions in this world. What we need is the truth of the gospel revealed in his word from beginning to end. We need the whole story. We need all of it. So all scripture is breathed out by God. And then he says, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So he says these scriptures, right? These scriptures, they're profitable for teaching. You want to know God? The word teaches you. It instructs you on who he is. You want to know who you were designed to be? It tells you who you were designed to be. And then this book is good for reproof and for correction. See, I think sometimes we, we think backwards about this. When we fall into sin so many times, the first thing we cut out is word, is the word of God. We cut it out. I don't know why. I think, I know for me sometimes it's, it's a, I'm afraid it's going to tell me what I already know, which is how bad I am, <laughs> Right? It's going to make me feel pain. I'm going to feel, I already feel guilty, so it's going to make me feel even guiltier. We think so backwards about this. It's not correcting you so that you can feel bad about yourself. It's correcting you because the grace of Jesus Christ and the glory of Jesus Christ is so much better. That what your flesh, what your heart, what your mind is telling you about that sin, that it's good, that it's satisfying, that it would be good for you, that your flesh and your mind and the enemy is lying to you. And when the word reads you, it tells you, stop believing the lies. What I have for you is so much better. What I have for you is so much better. This book, it teaches us, it corrects us, it trains us, it prepares us for every circumstance. Not to conquer the circumstance, but it prepares us for faith in Christ throughout all circumstances. That the word is cemented in our hearts and we say, God, the world may be in chaos around me, but I believe you. Turn my unbelief to belief. I believe what you say is true. This book, it's not, it's not a gift. I mean, it's not a chore. It's a gift. It's a gift. Sorry. Second Peter 3. Go to, uh, let me finish up Second Peter 3, verse 17. He says, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own so if you read the few verses uh, right before this, because you can't just pull text out of the Bible, um, if you read the few verses right before this, verse 17, 
um, you'll see that Peter is telling this church that they are not to believe the false teachers that are distorting the words of Paul. Okay, um, Let me, in fact, read verse 16. He says, there are some things in them, talking about Paul's letter, that are hard to understand. Don't miss that. So we're not alone here. Okay, There are some things in Paul's letter that are hard to understand. And he says, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So he warns them, he wants them to be aware that there are some whose aim, to dis- whose aim is to distort the scriptures. And so his warning is, now that you know this, be careful that you are not caught up in their teaching. And we don't have time to really go into this, but what is happening in the world today, you know, I think um, we get amped up about it because it's today, it's in our life. But it's no different than any other time that's any other time in the world. It's no different. Right? It's no different than what was happening here with Peter. Right? He's saying they are distorting the words of Paul. Don't believe them. It's no different um, when they met at the Council of Nicaea in 325, talking about the incarnation of Jesus. There were people who were distorting the word of God. It's no different than the Reformation. There were people who were distorting the word of God. It's no different than in the Great Awakening. There were people who were distorting the word of God, and it's no different today. This will happen over and over and over and over again. And our role as believers is to be aware of it, but plant our feet in the ground and say, no, I know the truth of the gospel. I know the truth of the gospel, and I will, be not, I will not be moved from this place, but I will trust God, make turn my unbelief into belief. So I just want to say that, yeah, I'm aware of it. You're aware of it. We're aware of it. But let's keep our feet planted and pray. Pray that they would see the truth, that others would come to know Christ, that they would be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and his word. Um, And then he says, grow. Verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so let me just give you, to close out the series, four things, four very simple things, um, that if we are going to be a body of believers, a faith family who believes his word, who... um, plants our feet in the ground um, that, can, that protects ourselves from false teaching, um, and a group of people, a faith family, who positions ourselves to before the Word of God and before the Holy Spirit, that we need both of them to be transformed. So four things, four things you need that we need as a faith family. First, you need your Bible. You know you need to read your Bible. You don't need me to tell you. You've heard it plenty of times. You need to read your Bible. I don't know what that looks like for you. I know a guy who did it at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. because he was a night owl. I don't recommend it, but he did it, and it worked for him, right? Figure out who you are, who God has wired you to be, when your mind is most awake, and use that time. Use that time. You need your Bible. You know it. So I'm just going to say it. You need it. You need your Bible. I would say, though, every single person, since we have the resources, we don't live in an unreached area. We have access to the gospel more than any other place in the world that every single one of you needs a study Bible. Every single one. Of, you know, I have, sometimes I say cool stuff, good things, not often, but sometimes I do. And when I do, someone will come up and say, hey, I like that thing you said in your sermon. Where did you get that? 90% of my sermon comes from my study Bible. 90%, right? Get a study Bible. There are plenty of good ones out there. The ESV study Bible is the one I use. Reformation study Bible. Uh, MacArthur study Bible. I mean, there's plenty of good study Bibles. We can help you. We can get you one, Okay. Um, but everyone, I would say everyone here needs to study. Second, you need your mind. Don't read the Bible and don't engage your mind. Don't read the Bible without engaging your mind. You need your mind. Ask questions, right? Go to each other with questions. Come to us with questions, right? Engage your mind, and there are resources to help you do that. We can get connected. Third, you need a community. You need people around you to walk with you. You need a home group. You need a home group. That if you sit in home group, man, when you, when you come to a text, there's going to be people coming from different places, different experiences, different backgrounds, and talking about this text. You need each other to find the truth. That you would walk with one another, talk with one another, find the truth of the word. And fourth, we absolutely need the Holy Spirit. We absolutely need the Holy Spirit. We cannot do this without the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. And the last thing I would say is we need to be humble. Maybe that's number five. We need to be humble. If you approach the word of God telling it what it thinks that you should say, you'll, you'll never be transformed. Approach it with humility. 
we approach one another with humility, that we would grow and that we would learn. Let me close by reading Psalm 119, 18, that this would be our prayer. And then I'll pray. Psalm 119, 18. The psalmist says, Open my eyes, open my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Open my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of your law.